have a question about testing. I know we've asked a lot of questions about testing. It's a national story, the shortage. Can you give us updated numbers to begin with on how many tests have been conducted and then I have a follow-up? Yes, so first on, on the number of tests that been, have been done. So we are able to report out on the number of tests that are done at the state lab, because um, that's the, the numbers that we track. Now that we're seeing private labs and our university partners and others come online, they're doing tests. So we, we don't have a great sense of the total number of tests. We know multiple places are doing it now, which is, is the good news. On our website now, once a day, we're updating the number of tests done at our state lab, and we'll continue to do that. Can you give me an updated number? I saw about 100 the last time I looked. That's, That's right. Good. I believe it's 101 as of 845 this morning. Now, we've done a number of tests over the course of the day, but again, things are rapidly evolving. We're trying to use one number a day, but we'll, we'll update those again. Can you help me because uh, let's, we're, we're 10 days removed from the first presumed positive. That's about 10 tests per day in a state of more than 10 million people. It seems like not very much. And you're talking about a capacity as of yesterday of 700. How many can you do a day and why can't you do that many? Sure. So what I would say. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you move the microphone just slightly closer to you? Yes, I can. Is that better? So what I would say is 100 tests at our state lab. Right, so other labs are testing. Um, and I think that's the critical thing to understand with, with testing now. So there's been a, a, a bunch of new developments, right? As we move through this, there are gonna be changes. And so something that might have been true on Monday is no longer true today on Friday. So today on Friday, um, we have changed the criteria um, that we uh, are advising in terms of physicians to use and other clinicians um, when they are ordering tests. We want clinicians to be able to order tests if they think that is necessary um, and to use their clinical judgment. What we are saying in terms of criteria is someone who has fever, who has lower respiratory symptoms, and who is flu negative. I'm going to turn all of you into doctors because you've heard me say it is still more common um, to be diagnosed with flu than COVID-19. We want to make sure that we're picking that up. Um, and so. As I said, lots of folks are testing right now, not just the state lab. We're reporting out on state lab numbers. So the, the total number of tests done for the state is a hard number for us to report, which is a, a good news because we are ramping up the availability of testing. Uh, last question on this part, but are you concerned that there are people out there who have COVID-19 you have not been able to test yet? So what I would say, if someone is having symptoms of fever, cough, lower respiratory illness, and um, they have been found negative for flu, we want them to get, get a test because we do want to make sure we are understanding um, the, the nature of the virus here in the state. Um, so, so please th make sure if you are, are having those symptoms, you can, and can call your doctor. Um, make sure you call ahead um, so that folks can be taking the proper um, precautions as you come into the office, but fever, cough, negative for flu. Are you concerned? I mean, it, clearly you want to do more testing. That's where you're headed. We're 10 days removed from the first presumed positive. Are you concerned that there are people out there now who have COVID-19? I think we also have to understand that testing is going to evolve as we move through different stages of this, um, uh, of this work. We have been largely in a posture of containment in this first stage, right? When we see contacts, someone traveled from China or traveled from Italy, as a case here in North Carolina. And then what we do is we, we want to see if they, those folks ha have any contact. As we move into different stages of this, and we, we have seeing this happen in New York, in California, in Washington, where there, where there is spread that is not associated with a travel contact, um, that is when um, you know, we certainly want to continue to do testing, but I think folks are associating with testing with somehow with treatment. I want to unfortunately remind folks, and I think this is why we are, are being aggressive in our prevention measures, unfortunately for COVID-19, we don't have medicines and we don't have a vaccine. Um, so testing, again, the importance of testing changes as we move through this. We want to be doing testing now, um, but I, I, I want to make sure that folks know what we want, we want folks to get access to is if they need medical attention, right, if they're having trouble breathing, 
right? That, that is something we want to make sure that they're getting medical attention for. The test isn't going to be the, the thing that um, uh, helps folks there. It, it's, it's access to our medical uh, uh, services, and that is what we are, are making sure that we are, are, are preparing for. Um, two questions for my first, very quickly. Are, no new cases today, is that correct? So the, as of 8.45, we are at 15. Yes. So. Same as yesterday and the day before, or, or just made the same. We see, but this is why we were trying to do this once a day. It's changing yeah. so quickly, so I don't know at what period of time. I believe that we were 12 yesterday, but the and days are running together. If I could ask, so what can you tell people as far as how long to expect the measures that are in place to be in place? How long before, for lack of a better phrasing, life goes back to normal or normal-ish? Yes, that is, that is a question um, I've heard from on a number of calls we did um, earlier today for some of our legislature. And, and that the hard thing is we don't know the answer to that. What we are doing is looking at what is happening in some of the countries that have been impacted earlier than us. So if you look at a country like China that did some of the very aggressive measures to, to lock down a particular area of their country and the ag aggressive social distancing measures, they really muted the spread of the virus. The question is now they, how do they start, quote unquote, going back to normal and what will that mean for them? So we are very much looking to see how that process goes and we're gonna learn from it. So it's, it's really something I can't share in terms of how long we'll be, we be in this process. We will just need to continue to watch the numbers, see the evolving science, and this is why we'll have constant communication. We're probably talking months, not weeks though, right? I I don't think that we can know that yet. Hi. Um, we're, our northern neighbors, Maryland and Virginia, public schools closed. Uh, here, we haven't gone that far, although there's some triangle area systems that are reshuffling their schedules and such. Is there something different here about the spread that leads to the decision making not to call for sc all schools to be closed? Or is something different in Maryland and Virginia that we, we don't have? Yes, so things have been rapidly evolving with school closures. And as we said yesterday, when we made the recommendation at, at this time, which was yesterday, uh, that um, we are not recommending preemptive closures of schools. We continue today to, to have that same, same recommendation. Today, at this time, we are not recommending preemptive closure of schools. However, things are changing rapidly. We're both looking at the science, the advice from the CDC, but also what's happening around our communities, getting feedback from our superintendents, understanding what our other state partners are doing that. And I think we need to take in all of that input as we make decisions. The CDC did just put out new guidance this morning related to school closures um, that helps try to help us understand how other countries have handled school closures and did it, did it seem to make a difference? And they're looking at um, two different countries, Hong Kong and Singapore, one that closed school, one that didn't, and they didn't really see much difference. And so the CDC recommendation, just based on what they're looking at and their modeling, does not currently recommend preemptive school closures. Now, what I would say is that we're gonna be taking in a lot of inputs, um, including understanding what our state partners are doing. So we wanna be on the phone with folks in Virginia and Maryland to understand their, their decisions. We wanna hear from our superintendents, we wanna hear from our communities and take in all that information. So we are where we are in terms of recommendations right now, um, but things, like I said, continue to evolve rapidly and we'll be, we'll be in touch if things change. Um, so, uh, the question that I have is um, about nursing homes and prisons. Uh, is enough being done to protect folks who are vulnerable and sort of confined right now? Sure, I'll take that. So uh, although there's a lot of things that we don't know about this virus, what we do know, right, is that um, people over 65 and those with underlying chronic medical conditions are at higher risk. And so I think that's why you saw those evolving recommendations throughout the week, that we started out first with recommendations squarely centered on our, on our high-risk um, population. And then you saw evolution of that, um, including um, 
yesterday's guidance as well. Um, and we've been really working really closely with our long-term care facilities, our um, adult care homes, taking this very, very seriously. And I think you saw that ramp up yesterday. Um, we also have guidance of our long-term care facilities. The Centers for Medicaid and Medicare have come up with guidance. We've been squaring that up. So that is an area that um, we do know that population is at high risk, and that's why you've seen that that was the leading edge of our guidance, and we're continuing to have more and more granular guidance on that. So great question, and that's a that's really important part. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and so we are working with our partners with um, the Department of Public Safety, um, and um, have guidance for correction facilities, and we're working closely with them as well. Yes, ma'am. Mecklenburg County, we're statewide station, so we've had some reporters over there asking me about this today. Um, there seems to be a, a severe shortage in testing happening in Mecklenburg County. Uh, we're hearing only three tests have actually been done since the outbreak started. Can you speak specifically to the largest county in the state with regard to testing? Is there a major shortage there? Is there something different going on? So we know we are testing across the state, and we are testing based on clinical criteria, right? So we want I, to, sorry to be repetitive, but to, make, to be, people have fever, cough, and are flu negative. Um, we are seeing tests come in both to our state lab and to our private partners um, from all over the state, um, including Mecklenburg County. I know that Atrium at their lab in Mecklenburg County is testing. A um, number of our positive cases were from that lab. So testing is happening um, across the state and at multiple labs. I do want to say there, there have been issues with testing and um, the supply of those, but in no time did that supply ever limit um, folks uh, to, to get the testing that they need when they met this clinical criteria um, that, that we have, um, that we've been able to put forward for our doctors. My other question, um, I, I know that obviously we're talking about people, you don't want to have gatherings of 100 or more in the state right now. I know that DPAC though is still having a show tonight, Lay Miz is playing. Um, if people are going to continue, if entities are going to continue to have those kind of gatherings despite that advice, what further advice might there be to, you know, make sure that they're mitigating um, this whole thing if they are going to continue to do those things? I think the governor was pretty clear yesterday that he highly recommends, I think he used the word urge, everyone to follow the recommendations of canceling or modifying uh, gatherings that include folks more than 100, 100 people. Um, and I understand that that is not an easy decision that we made. We did it to help protect the health and safety of the folks here in North Carolina. Um, we urge people to follow those recommendations. We urge uh, event organizers to cancel or modify those events. I, I think the governor also mentioned yesterday if we don't see folks uh, complying with those that he would consider using other authorities if he needs to. Uh, I think we're going to give folks time to adjust. We just gave those guidelines, uh, you know, less than 24 hours ago. So we understand that that um, uh, folks need to absorb that and put that in, in, into place in, in some uh, some aspects. But if folks aren't following those, we will be exploring other authorities that we might need to exercise, um, including working with our counties and their authorities and looking at our, our state authorities as well. Um, so I understand that the state is not counting cases um, that they're te that they're testing through private labs. Um, are those or the the, the number of tests? You guys aren't tracking that, obviously. Um, when, if they were to get a presumptive positive, is that sent to you guys, or to, does it have to be confirmed by the CDC? Um, if they get a positive, does it have to be retested at a state lab? What does that process look like? Yes, great question. So first, um, based on uh, our agreements that if any lab does become positive, then they are required to report that to us, which is why we can be sure that we are tracking all of the positives. They are not required to tell us all of the negatives, which is why we don't know the all of the negative tests and, and that are going across the state. We do, they are required to share all of the positives. And um, so we will have a central repository of that I don't know if there's any, sorry, the second half of your. Um, so if, if um, they were to have a presumptive positive, did, does that person have to be retested in a state lab or by the CDC? Um, um, no, so what um, the commercial labs are, their first five positives and five negatives are sent to us for confirmation. Um, just and then once that happens, then, um, then, that's, then that's done and they don't, it doesn't have to be sent to the CDC as well, so. 
I have another separate question. Um, do we know if any of the cases so far here are the result of community transmission? So it's a great question. So there's new cases coming in all the time, and I think we are still understanding some of the details of the most recent cases. But oh, sorry. Okay, maybe she knows more than I do. Okay. I do know. That. Okay. Anticipating this one. <laughs> um, to date, all of our cases have had either a travel exposure or a known contact um, exposure, and that is something that we are are definitely following. If I may ask you a series of questions, on, I don't know how much you know about this, but we've had a lot of questions from women who are pregnant. Um, uh, first of all, is there a higher risk of any sort that you know of for pregnant women? And this could be for either Dr. Tillerson or, Tillerson or uh, Dr. Cohen. Is there a higher uh, risk for pregnant women, first of all? Um, yeah, I got you. So um, on our DHHS website, we actually have a tab um, for um, uh, special populations, including information on pregnant women. It also links you to the CDC guidance on pregnant women. So I definitely would direct you to our um, to our website right now. Um, the data that we have, although. Um, uh, the data that we have does not show that pregnant women are at higher risk, but again, our data is, is negative, but uh, our data is, is um, limited, but we don't have any indication that right now pregnant women are at higher risk. Again, the data that we do know is that older people and those with underlying chronic health conditions, those, are, those people are at higher risk. Um, but right now, we don't have um, uh, data to show that pregnant women are at higher risk. Also, to date, there's no data to show that the um, the, the babies that are born um, are um, infected or that it seems to be um, the virus um, is expressed in breast milk. So that's all good news. It's preliminary data. Of course, our, we always look at our special populations. We'll be continuing to look at that. Um, but that is what the data is showing now. And I would definitely um, direct you to our website um, that directs to the CDC website for the most up-to-date information on that po special population. Great job in anticipating my follow-up question. Um, <laughs> I, I think you've answered all of those. If I may do two things before, we, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Sprayberry a question. But first, Dr. Tilson, I would like to ask you. The other day uh, the, in the news conference, and you repeated again today, I apologize, um, that the age 65. But the CDC's age is 60. Why the discrepancy there? Well, I, I was going to say the CDC says older adults. They don't give an age. And so I think it's. Oh, oh, was that a, as of, oh, see, things are evolving. <laughs> so, ahead. right, sorry, so sorry, uh, when we were making that call, yeah. the CDC said older adults. So we looked at some of the data from um, South Korea, um, and you start seeing it ticking up. Um, and so then we, we said 65. We had a call with the CDC that night who said, yep, that seems reasonable. Um, so that's, that was the point of time, the best decision we had when the guys from CDC at that point said older. So that's... Sorry. Three, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything is on gradation, uh, right? So, you know, there's no magic number, but looking at that data, that seemed to be um, a, a, a reasonable <coughs> cut point. If I could ask Mr. Sprayberry one quick question. Um, it, it, is it possible that this will rise, could rise to the level where you need to ask the National Guard for assistance? And if so, what triggers that? If you would hand him the mic, that would be. I'm going to model good behavior, and I'm going to hold it in front of him. <laughs> so it's interesting that you would ask me that question because I was with the adjutant general um, right before I came in here, and we were just chatting about what that would look like if the situation became more widespread and, and we needed additional resources. And so uh, if we use the National Guard, we anticipate using them in more of a a planning function. Uh, they've got some really superior uh, planners that have a lot of experience, and we've actually already begun to use a couple, and we anticipating using them in the coming uh, days and weeks as the event continues to unfold. There's also opportunities to use them in not just normal planning scenarios, but also logistical planning scenarios, as well as uh, perhaps uh, ordering equipment and supplies. And so those are the kind of things that uh, we would look at as far as using them. You don't envision any sort of circumstance where they need to be out act actively doing something in force? Not at this time, but you know, we're still learning a lot about this uh, coronavirus. And so um, 
I don't like to say anything's ever off the table, but at this time, we don't foresee anything like that. The president uh, just spoke and talked about billions of dollars flowing to states, millions of tests becoming available through uh, private labs uh, primarily. How do you see that playing out here in North Carolina? So the CDC did give guidance this week about a first uh, round of funding. Um, I think it's about 13 million that was earmarked for North Carolina. And I know our folks are working through now understanding what are the parameters of those dollars. Um, we, we know that, that this um, response effort um, is going to be one where resources are needed, but we also know that there's going to be lives impacted, um, econo real economic impacts for folks. Um, the decisions we are making are, are hard ones for our state, um, and we know that we want to be able to support folks as we keep them safe. So there's going to be a number of aspects where resources will come into play here. Um, and so we are still working through understanding what, what exactly from the federal pack, that first federal package is, is, is earmarked to the people of North Carolina, both from a health perspective or economic perspective. Um, and then if there's a second round of that, what would that mean? Um, and we, we do anticipate needing some additional support in terms of state dollars. Again, those are things where we are working through, but nothing, nothing in terms of having a dollar amount right now to, to talk about. One last time, back to our original conversation. With, with testing, people asking questions about testing, considering what you've said about social distancing, washing your hands, should we all act like we have it or others have it? I, I mean, I know that's a, a very simplistic question, but I, I mean, essentially, is that what we're talking about since we don't all know? We're asking folks to use their best judgment and to be vigilant. If you have a fever, if you have a cough, um, to, to make sure that you are, are staying at home if you are sick um, and use good judgment. And for the rest of us, we, we know that, we're, we're, that hand washing, that using hand sanitizer and wiping down surfaces, it works. Um, going back to the guidance that we saw from CDC and looking at, at a country like Singapore and the kinds of interventions that they did, they did not close schools, but they did excessively aggressive uh, um, wiping down of surfaces for folks who have traveled there know it's an exceptionally clean country uh, to begin with, and they went even further. Um, so right, uh, those matter. The, the hand washing, the disinfecting surfaces, um, the social distancing um, uh, uh, does, does work, and it, we, we see it working in Singapore. We're trying to learn lessons from, from places where uh, it seems to be working, and we obviously want to avoid the negative lessons of other countries that um, didn't take early enough action. Again, we, we have to take in a lot of inputs. Um, looking at the science that is rapidly evolving, new guidance that is coming out every day, as well as understand what other countries um, have done and try to learn from them. And, and, and different folks have taken different approaches. None of them are, 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 are wrong. I think folks are trying to do the best we can in a situation that is changing very quickly. Um, and so that's why we'll, we will keep reevaluating uh, this. And I know I will see all of your faces again soon as we have uh, more, more guidance to share. Um, I just want folks to have accurate and timely information, so I'd always encourage folks to go back to our web website, ncdhhs.gov backslash coronavirus. Um, maybe this touches on the, uh, what you just said, doctor, but uh, we, we've been talking with uh, parents who have visited pediatricians and the pediatrician telling the parent earlier this week, it doesn't matter that kids are not getting heavily impacted by this. Can you justify as far as uh, leaving schools open by saying it's not affecting kids when kids could bring it home potentially to vulnerable family members? Yeah, so as I said, we're trying to understand the, the rapidly evolving nature of, of the virus. The What we see, the good news is, is that um, it's not that children don't get the virus. It's the, the severity, it seems like, in children is, is much less. So that is good from a health and safety of our children perspective. So then it becomes where, 
um, and how do we best protect the whole public health, right? And, and that is where we need to take in lots of inputs. We need to understand the CDC guidance and that CDC school guidance, which does not recommend preemptive school closure, is based on you know, looking at a couple of the other countries that have seemed to, to lower the spread of disease to say what did they do and what seemed to help. And we know that closing schools potentially can have a lot of unintended consequences. So we know that, uh, I didn't know this statistic until I saw the CDC guidance, but that 40% of, of children um, often get their childcare from their grandparents. And so we close the schools, how many of our kids are gonna be with grandma and grandpa? Understandably, because mom and dad have to go to work. And then are we putting grandma and grandpa at higher risk. I think those are the things in the science that are, that there's a world of gray here that we want to understand, right? So we um, want to understand if closing the schools, um, uh, you know, is, is a decision that individual um, uh, municipalities are making right now. We certainly want to hear from our superintendents what they're hearing from families, um, want to put that together with all these other inputs. So I said things are rapidly evolving, um, but it is, it is not a, a black and white uh, uh, situation. And so I'd say continue to check back with us as we try to take in all these inputs and make good decisions for the people of North Carolina. We and others had reported last night that there were 17 cases in North Carolina. I see that the number today is 15. Is there an explanation for, were we just wrong? I, I mean, a number of media outlets had it at 17 yesterday. I don't know where they got 17 from. So that's why we're trying to, trying to get into this rhythm of once a day updates so we can all go with the same numbers. Um, and that way, that way, if there is is a case that pops over the course of the day that might happen, we will update it the next the next day. But, but as of this morning, it's certainly 15, 15, and that's presumptive and confirmed cases. That's correct. And no deaths. Correct. Oh, and are, are they all still at home as opposed to being in the hospital? That is, yes, correct. I think one question was, can't the June report something up to review? Was there, was there a problem there, or is that, what, what happened? So, my understanding was that was one that happened over the course of today, um, so I think that will be updated for tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. Let us confirm that, yeah. but I, is that? I'm not sure where yeah. it is in the, in the cadence of it. Yes, I'm pretty sure yes. that happened over the course of today, which is why it'll show up for tomorrow. Yeah, but it will show up. So in that announcement today that Trump made, um, he said um, that there were going to be drive-through testing labs. And I wonder if, like, what are your thoughts about it? Do you think it would be helpful in North Carolina? And sort of how would it be? Yeah. So that is definitely one of the tools in the toolbox that we are looking at. Um, we know a, a couple of other states that seem a little ahead of where North Carolina is in terms of the progression of, of this have used tools like that and, and others. So very much something our team is looking at and it's, uh, that um, we have been coordinating with our hospitals to understand what, what they are thinking about. So um, stay tuned for additional details as we work through those. And if you would just do, if you would just update what I heard earlier this week here when you talked about getting 1,500 more tests this next week, being short on chemicals, but getting 1,500 tests next week, and there was an alternative that might be done for testing. So what is the status of what we expect to have coming up? Yes, I don't know the... I don't know where the 1500 number came from, so we'll have to get back to you on that. But um, the the issue around limited supplies for the lab, I want to distinguish that between swabs for our nose or swabs. But the lab supplies continue to, the reagents continue to be an issue right now. And we have reported that we feel that we have the capacity at our state lab um, that around 600 more people, but we also know, again, all of the other private labs are increasing their capacity. We still, at the state lab, do have a supply chain issue. We have been working um, very closely with the FDA and the CDC to troubleshoot and try to see if there's another mechanism we can use that would, would circumvent the supply chain issues, but we haven't uh, quite gotten there. Obviously, our teams are working night, night and day on, on this, this issue. Um, there, the supply chain continues to be a real, real challenge, but we are glad to see that our private partners are able to increase their capacity um, at this point. So again, folks who have uh, fever, cough, and are flu negative um, are able to get tested. Any alternative testing? 
So yeah, we're trying to look for other mechanisms to do the same kind of testing using a different supply chain that might might be more uh, uh, easily used. Haven't been able to, to bring up that for a variety of reasons, but our teams are working with the FDA to try to find a, a way forward. I'm hopeful, but I'm not, we're not there yet. Thank you very much.